Pints with Jack, Season 4, Episode 37, After Hours with Chris Armstrong. (laughs) Welcome, everyone. Pints with Jack is your weekly C.S. Lewis podcast where David, Andrew, and I break down and discuss the works of C.S. Lewis. This season, we are eavesdropping on the correspondence of a senior demon, Screwtape, as he explains how to tempt the patient, a human assigned to be tempted by Screwtape's nephew, Wormwood. Each week we'll be considering a different letter, untwisting Screwtape's hellish logic, and forming a battle plan for our own spiritual lives. However, if you are, as you're listening to this, today is a Thursday, which means it is an after hours episode. And I am quite excited for this guest because David sent me the book a couple months ago and he told me, hey, you got to read this book. You're going to be interviewing this gentleman. And he actually said he intentionally selected this because he thought I would greatly enjoy this book and this individual, particularly because of my love of church history. And I've spent more time in the early church history. So I'm reading right now, as I mentioned to you guys in the last episode, uh, early voice, Voices of the Early Church, and then I have a book after it, The Four Witnesses, I believe, of the Early Church or something. And this one, this book, is going to more focus on the medieval church, and particularly C.S. Lewis as a guide to help us navigate some of the wisdom from that. And so let me stop talking there and uh, introduce our guest. He is Dr. Chris Armstrong, and he is an educator, academic entrepreneur, author, editor, and church historian, trained at Duke University in Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. He currently serves as Program Fellow in Faith, Work, and Economics for the Ken the Kern Family Foundation. Before that, he taught for nine years at Bethel Seminary and served as faculty member and founding director of a Faith and Vocation Institute at Wheaton College. Chris serves as senior editor of Christian History Magazine, and he also blogs now and then at grateful to the dead.com. He's author of Medieval Wisdom for Modern Christians, which is what we'll be discussing today. And from my reading of it, he talked a little bit about his background and fun fact in there. He grew up in a home where his father, who was a theology professor, read to him and his brothers C.S. Lewis, J.R.R. Tolkien, George MacDonald, and many others. And that greatly shaped his imagination and faith. So if you're like me, you're thinking to yourself, if my father would have done that, It would have saved me a lot of trouble. And so, Dr. Armstrong, welcome to Pints with Jack. Thanks so much, uh, Matt. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for the invitation. I am excited, too. And so we start with a quote of the week, which I have taken from your book, and just one that jumped out to me when I was reading it. And here's what you say. Recognize that the road to the church's future is through its past, and break out the candles and incense. Pray the Lectio Divina. Tap all the riches of Christian tradition that you can find. So can you help us place that in the context of what you meant? Because I took that massively out of context, probably. (laughs) (laughs) No, you didn't at all. I mean, uh, I stand by my statement. It's a good idea to, uh, as as the late Bob Weber used to say, uh, reach out to the church's future through the past. He wrote that series of books with the phrase ancient future in it, the ancient future church. On rereading it, I cringed a little bit because... It reminded me of a kind of cafeteria approach to earlier Christian items, breaking out candles, praying certain prayers. Um, I think unmoored from the deeper wisdom, that can be a little surfacy. But hey, you got to start somewhere. And uh, I, I will still stand by the statement that we should tap all the riches of Christian tradition that we can find. I love it. And then drink of the week, we usually have like a scotch or a pint, but both of us are recording this right around lunchtime. So it might be a little early (laughs) and it's a work day. Yep. So I've got my LaCroix and you have... I have Spindrift, the cousin of Uh, LaCroix. uh, There we go. (laughs) And so for the Patreon toast, we always do a gold level supporter. And this one is a new Patreon from... The UK, his name is Matt, which what a wonderful name. What a gift from God. Such a great name. (laughs) Such a great name. And so Matt, may you create the space daily for Christ to continue forming within you and drawing you up into the Trinitarian dance Lewis describes. Cheers. Hey, that's Paralandra, isn't it? It it is. I, I for me, it's a little bit of that. For me, the where I was really thinking with the Trinitarian dance was from mere Christianity. And oh, sure. I really yeah. love when he talks about that pulsating activity, that dynamic life. And then he goes, I think he says, and if you would not consider me too bold or something, a sort of dance. 
And yeah. I just really appreciated that description. And it makes me think of so much that Christian life being drawn up into that. And honestly, that pouring into you and the transformation that happens. It's just, it's a beautiful image. It is. It's wonderful. He does have a way with images. <laughs> Uh, which maybe, as we'll learn today, came a little bit from his reading of the medieval church. I think so. All right. Well, let's dump, jump right in. And we always like to start out with uh, authors asking them how they were first introduced to C.S. Lewis, which I kind of alluded to in your introduction. Yeah. Yeah. It was probably my dad reading those stories. It was at the dinner table. Uh, I've never figured out how, how he managed to read stories while eating. And, and you know, his articulation was always perfect. So there's some kind of some kind of physiological trick there about how you can do that. You know, that was his fiction. I was introduced to his fiction there. His nonfiction I was introduced to as a college student when a group of campus ministry folks, I was not a believer, uh, not until my early 20s, and a group of campus ministries folks uh, were kind of trying to evangelize me and kind of using Lewis as a bit of an apologetic stick, you know, to sort of argue me into the kingdom. Um <laughs> I have to be honest, that put me off. I did not, after that, for many, for even decades, I did not read much in the way of Lewis's nonfiction. Although I had a university professor who, uh, a Catholic man in my religious studies program, I uh, was not a Christian, but I was taking religious studies, uh, <laughs> who used the book, uh, The Four Loves, which I thought was a wonderful book, and I learned a lot from it. So that that was the exception. But when I first read Mere, Mere Christianity, I was kind of like, I, I couldn't shake this feeling that he was a bit of an intellectual bully. Uh, and I think this probably came from that early exposure in that kind of apologetic mode. We'll use this this big brained uh, English guy to kind of beat you on the head and give you the arguments <laughs> for why you should be Christian. <laughs> that's, that's not how I finally became a Christian. So. Well, now I got to ask, what was the thing that did get you to become a Christian? Well, um, the short answer is the Holy Spirit. Uh, mm-hmm. The longer answer would be uh, the witness and testimony and prayers of my parents, as well as friends who I knew who uh, who were in the faith. Um, and uh, yeah, and a sense of conviction of some directions my own life was going. That's so. incredible. That's great to hear. I know I have people in my life who have individuals who aren't Christians or falling away and they really struggle with that. And it just goes to show the power of prayer and yeah, never, never stop that. Absolutely. I, uh, I, I was at a charismatic church when I was baptized on a big tank halfway up the wall, big congregation. And I stood up there. They ask you if you want to say a few words before you're baptized. I said, young people, if your parents are praying for you, give up now. <laughs> ahead, just, just go ahead and become a Christian. <laughs> I'm going to remember that. I hope I don't need to ever say that to my kids. Kids, just Hopefully give up not. now. Just give up now. <laughs> just, 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 I got you. God's got you. God and I have an agreement. You don't have any choice. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Save yourself a lot of pain and trouble and just come to That's this side. Right. That's right. Uh, well, bless God for that. And can you walk us through what brought you to studying the wisdom of the medieval church? Sure. Um, I think the die was maybe cast when, um, as a young Christian, again, it was 1985. I was 22 when I came to Christ. And in those years, there was a magazine, which I have since worked with many times. I've become an editor in a couple of different roles it's called Christian History Magazine. And I ran across some copies of it, was looking through it, and I thought, um, this is maybe what I want to do with my life. Um, because for me, there was a mixture of kind of intellectual integrity. Um, there was a real sense that these people were disciplined in the ways they were studying the past, but it was also extremely engaging and powerful to read. Um, and what that meant for me in particular, my dad's a theologian, you mentioned, philosophical theologian, uh, wrote his dissertation at Yale on um, time and eternity. He claims he doesn't understand it now. I think, that, I think that's untrue. But I did find that the theology for me was tremendously interesting and engaging, but at a certain point could get fairly abstract. And I wanted to know how all of these ideas would be lived out in, in daily life. And that's what the History Magazine uh, did for me. So an extension of that. Now, I ended up, uh, I, I made a decision in my master's program uh, I was looking back and forth from the medieval era to sort of modern evangelicalism. And I said, I really want to understand my own church experience that I've gotten into. So I'm going to go for the kind of the evangelical study, the American study, which I did. Um, always regretted that a little bit. Or not always, um, but uh, increasingly, I guess, over the last uh, 10 years or so, I've thought, man, the one thing that the medieval church has that I would have found helpful is 
that was an era, I roughly say 500 to 1500. There's lots of ways of, of slicing it, but 500 to 1500 AD, when every area of human endeavor and enterprise, every part of human life, all of the ways in which we create culture, all the institutions we create, um, the medieval church had theological ways of understanding those things and of of teaching how to uh, live one's life in those activities. Um, I have not found that to be true often of American evangelicalism. There's been a sense of a, a bit of a gap there. Um, as much as it does other things quite wonderfully, there is a, a sort of endemic spiritualization of the faith that that, says, that doesn't answer questions about, well, what about, um, and of course, there's individual ex- uh, uh, um, counterexamples to this, but what do I do with uh, family life? Uh, that one, perhaps evangelicals have done better, but political life, how do I handle my work, uh, economic life? Um, what about the institutions I find myself in? What about the university, if I'm going to a university that seems to be a secular place and um little did i know but came to know that the university was thoroughgoingly christian in its origins in about the 11th or 12th century of um, the medieval west that the hospital and healthcare thoroughly christian in the west in its origins uh out of the church the arts the science and technology even which i had been taught to think was somehow anti-Christian or that the church had been against those things. It turns out not to really have been the case. All of those stories take place within the medieval era. And that's, I think, where I became fascinated with those stories. So you you have this medieval era and you just described what that looked like. And Mm -hmm. going back to that, what what caused us to go away from that after that 1500? What was what was the dynamic and where has it gone to now? Yeah, great question. I mean, in evangelical circles, I would say uh, the most obvious and recent um, answer to that question would be the fundamentalist modernist controversy in the early 20th century. So that would be the point at which those who are interested in saving souls and in the Orthodox Christian faith, uh, the gospel as it was taught through much of uh, Christian history, the the small Orthodox understandings of, of faith and gospel were arrayed against those who were more modernist, more progressive, more liberal in their interpretation of the Christian faith. And the latter, the liberals, hung on to the social dimensions of faith, um, sometimes in some ways that made the conservatives, the fundamentalists, uncomfortable, uh, but were very attentive to questions of our economic life, our social life, um, questions of justice and injustice and so forth. And so there's this unfortunate split between um, sort of souls and social concerns that happens in the early 20th century. And uh, even though evangelicals today have come pretty far in terms of engaging culture back from that very separatist, fundamentalist kind of culture, um, there's a, there is a lingering, unfortunate division. And I call it, we can get into this later, but I call it immediatism in my introductory chapter, this sense that all that matters is what happens immediately between us and God. We can go straight to God and those other things, the vertical dimension Mm -hmm. and the horizontal dimension is sort of this temporary thing. There's a whole um, eschatology around this. It's all going to burn anyway. You know, we're we're going to heaven sort of thing. And of course, um, if you're interested, as I have been and many are, in those larger questions of what about life and society now? What about politics? What about culture? Uh, you don't get a lot of help from that uh, tradition, unfortunately, that anti-traditional tradition. Well, and I'm glad you brought up that immediatism. Can you contrast that? I could be off with this of my understanding, but you you talked it in great deal with immediatism, as you said, directly between you and God to some degree. But then you talked about me- mediation, like through mm-hmm. the church and through the material. And as like these different ways, can you talk a little bit about both of those and like the contrast and sure. their relationship together? Sure. sure. Yeah, I think we've been uncomfortable, and this is a bit of a Reformation heritage, but it's become intensified in evangel- modern evangelicalism. We've become uncomfortable with ways in which the religion of an ordinary person might need to be in, uh, mediated by faithful communion with a community or with things called sacraments or with the role of a, of a priest or a pastor. Um, a pastoral role in evangelical circles generally tends to be kind of a cheerleading to your own personal spiritual life. It's not this, it's not this kind of sacramental role, which of course would have been more 
characteristic of, of a, a Roman Catholic or a, an Orthodox church. Um, more broadly speaking, uh, we tend to think of our theological ideas as being the, at least the central ones as kind of coming straight from the mind of God and being kind of obvious through scripture. So, um, you know, the idea of the Trinity, the idea of uh, the incarnation or the two natures of Christ. Well, you know, those are just sort of obvious. They come straight from scripture. Well, it turns out through history, they were not obvious at all. Um, there's two different streams of evidence about uh, Jesus and who he was in scripture. One of it, which is he says things like, uh, why do you call me good? No man is good or implying he's, he's just a man or all I do is be obedient to what the father says, which applies a sort of subservient role. Um, it's not at all. The word Trinity is never used in scripture. It's not at all immediately obvious that this is the case. So how do we get there through centuries of reflection, through a communal kind of interpretation, through church councils, which sometimes look really messy and political and they'd hold one in a hurry. So people from a certain part of the world couldn't show up and, <laughs> and, and have their vote counted and just all of this stuff. And you just it's really like um, uh, as as has been said, you know, if you if you're a fan of the law. You don't want to kind of see how laws are made because that's how the sausage was made. <laughs> and there was some real sausage making going on in the ways those doctrines reach us. Now, the historical church, its main divisions, even the Protestant church has believed that the Holy Spirit was present and superintending in, in those processes and that the councils uh, made from flawed human beings, just as the writers of the scriptural books were flawed human beings, were nonetheless guided uh, not not perhaps in the same uh, absolute way, but in a, in, in a way that preserved um, the truth of the gospel and preserved the truths of who God is and who Jesus is. Um, and uh, that is mediation. And we're uncomfortable with it. We want to go straight to God. We want to go straight to God kind of emotionally in our devotional lives. We want to go straight to God intellectually in the ways we read scripture that, uh, you know, just give me that plain old, you know, uh, the Bible says it. I believe it. That settles it. Uh, you know, sort of. Easy. And and there's, uh, if you go to seminary, the first thing you get if you haven't gotten it before is kind of hit in the face with the interpretive complexity of handling these things. And uh, I don't think evangelicals have done really well with complexity. If you don't mind me asking, and if you don't feel comfortable answering this, this is fine. Sure. What a way to start a question, right? <laughs> <laughs> I plead the fifth. <laughs> So it could be helpful for listeners here. So you coming from that background and then studying this, how has this impacted your theology and your your own spiritual journey? So how have you like incorporated this into your theology yeah. and your religious practices? Yeah, I mean, not to, not to sort of give away the end from the beginning, but in the book, um, as I began to explore some of these themes, what I really concluded where this kind of deep cultural engagement and theological thoughtfulness came from in the medieval church is really a seriousness about especially the doctrine and and truth of the incarnation. Um, I've I've said before um, in an issue of Christian History magazine about uh, the Virgin Mary that I that I edited. Um, we think about Mary kind of once a year. She crosses the stage at the Christmas pageant and then she exits stage left and away we go. I'm talking about Protestant evangelicals. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, uh, you know, I'm not in a position now where I venerate Mary. Uh, there are still ways in which I would differ myself from Roman Catholic believers on Mary. But what Mary does and has always done for believers who, including Martin Luther, by the way, who was a huge fan of Mary's, to, to put it uh, a little crudely, um, is, is to really focus our attention on the humanity and the incarnation of Christ. Now, if we do that, if we focus on that, what does it mean that God has entered his own creation and indeed that part of the creation, which is human beings? Um, there's a there's a stream of understanding called Christian humanism that would say, and this is quite orthodox and goes all the way back to the early church fathers, that would say one thing that that does is it raises the dignity of what it means to be a human being and 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 really kind of says in all of our experience, we potentially meet God. Um, God takes creation up in him and with him as he becomes a part of that creation and he raises the dignity, not only of humanity, but of creation. Um, so my own practice, uh, I tend to take a higher view of the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. Um, I, I wouldn't subscribe to a, a strictly kind of Aristotelian version, like a, 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 a transubstantiation. I understand where that comes from, and uh, I, I, I understand that impulse. But I would say in some sense, 
I have to believe there's a real presence of Christ in in um, in, in the communion. I'm unhappy with a more um, a sort of yeah, well he's there, but he's in the kind of the congregation sort of thing. Uh, and now all of your Baptist listeners have just turned off the uh, podcast. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, along with Lewis, um, I mean Lewis trod something of the same path. Um, I I worship uh, Anglican now, more evangelical Anglican. I'm more happy with a service that's a little bit higher than lower. Uh, I find that um, uh, attention to our bod- body and our senses in worship is a good and salutary thing. Um, so that has changed my practice. And, um, uh, you know, I, I want, although I, I haven't really achieved it, to experience something of the Ignatian affirmation of the imagination and of images um, within or the orthodox affirmation of images um, which again, the whole church shares, the Western church shares it. Um, when John of Damascus in the ninth century has to defend icons against an emperor who wants to just get rid of them and say, you're worshiping idols, that's a bad thing. He says, no, we're not. Um, and Christ became a human being. And so, you know, he said, by taking on a body, he's sort of given his blessing to this sense that we can come to God through these mediations, again, of the material more broadly including of images. Of course, we don't worship the images, but they become kind of a focal point and a way of us being raised above that to God. So I would say those are some some ways, imperfect ways, that um, my kind of spiritual journey has changed in, in some of this work. That was super helpful. And it just reminded me, I forgot I'm supposed to say hi from Andrew Lazo. When you mentioned, oh, hey, the, Andrew. <laughs> when you mentioned the, uh, the Anglican, I was like, I first, I first I forgot that he said he knew you, and yeah, I was about yeah. to say, oh, yeah, actually, one of our kind of now third co-hosts is uh, Anglican Seminary, and uh, and I was like, yes. oh, wait, he told me I have to say hi. <laughs> I first met Andrew at Mecca, and Mecca, as UCS Lewis fans will know, is the Marion Wade Center at Wheaton College. <laughs> so at least that's my interpretation, <laughs> uh, that wonderful research center, which if some of our readers haven't been there, you should really go. But yeah, Andrew was sitting there working on one of his brilliant essays or books or something, and we hung out a bit together. So hi, Andrew. He's been a uh, blessing to have uh, as a co-host. And I have to say, when I was reading your parts, because what you just mentioned uh, with the incarnation, it was so beautiful. You had two sections in your book that I really liked. One was on that sacramental view of creation. I remember Mm -hmm. reading for the first time, because I've only ever just thought of sacraments, the sacraments directly. And a few mm. couple years ago, I read something that talked about like a sacramental worldview. Mm. And mm-hmm. it just seems so beautiful. And then I got in this kick that I go, someday I really want to write a book on like a sacramental view of creation in humans. And then your whole thing starts talking about it. And I go, oh my goodness, this is just the best thing ever. <laughs> oh. oh gosh. Well, thanks. Uh, people like Joe Rigney. Um, Joe Rigney's one I know who's written on that related to Lewis, um, Michael Whitmer, not as much related to Lewis, but has written a couple books, uh, related to that. There's really something in it. And it's, it's a more traditionally Christian way of looking at things. The best book I've ever read on the sacramental uh, worldview is by Hans Borsma, formerly from Regent College. Now it's in the show to house. The book is called heavenly participation, weaving a sacramental tapestry. And it's great. But historically I got my stuff from Gregory the great initially. Okay. It has it has this way of looking at the at the world had. So. And I appreciated uh, one final count before we kind of jump into a little sure. bit of Lewis here. I appreciated your section on transubstantiation uh, when you were talking about how you could see where it come about, and yeah. you use this analogy of how a lot of times people are turned off, like, okay, how can this be the case? You have the accident saying the same, but the essence changing, and you go, well, right. look, at, look at Jesus Christ and the, yes. the outer human the humanity, but then the divinity in the essence is like. Holy cow, I've never thought of it that way. I underlined the entire page, screenshotted <laughs> it to David, and I said, how did he just explain this better than I've had anyone? <laughs> so well done with that. <laughs> oh, thanks. I appreciate it. Every once in a while, even as they used to say in North Carolina, where I lived for a while, uh, even a blind hog roots the occasional acorn. So anyway. <laughs> so I, I wanted to I actually unpack that a little bit more before bringing in Lewis, because yeah. I thought it'd be really helpful for our listeners to have that framework so now let's bring in Lewis. And why did you choose him to be the guide and how does he guide us through this? 
Yeah, I have to be I have to make a confession here. Initially, I chose him because I knew that evangelicals would read a book with his name on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, uh, it was a little more than that. Even then, I had a sense that he had some good things to say about this. But what happened was, as I thought about titling, uh, bringing him in as a key figure in this book, I actually mentioned early on, I think I could have brought him, Lewis, Chesterton, Williams. I thought I could have brought the whole Sayers. I could have brought the whole gang in. Mm-hmm. So many of them in his circle, and this is the first clue, were medievalists, either professionally or avocationally. Uh, Chesterton and Williams were avocationally medievalists, but Sayers and Tolkien were both professionally uh, medievalist, as was Lewis. He identified himself in that way. But it wasn't because he was a professional medievalist, finally, that I chose him. It was, uh, and, and in part, again, I, I mean, I knew that I had an uphill battle. Uh, um, we did surveys of our readership at Christian History Magazine, and medieval sort of was dead last in its interest, which is kind of, kind of, that's a nice challenge. You know, they wanted to read about the early church, the Reformation, the American church. Oh, yeah, maybe about the medieval church. So I thought, <laughs> oh, come on, I'm going to need some help here to get people to actually read this. Um, but as it turns out, I, I really came to the conclusion um, that Lewis was not only professionally, but as I, as I call it, intuitively a medievalist. Mm-hmm. He claimed in a in a talk he gave in the early 50s when he uh, entered his chair in um, uh, medieval uh, literature at Cambridge University after being at Oxford for most of his career. He uh, he gave that wonderful address, De Descriptione Temporum, where he said, you have among you now a dinosaur, somebody who essentially sees through medieval eyes uh, and early eyes. Uh, You should you should kind of. Uh, make use of him while you have him, just as if a dinosaur had just walked into the room. You know, for science, you should you should you should study me. Um, and I, I uh, the more I read, the more I was convinced that this was in fact, uh, you know, as much as possible. It's obviously a bit of hyperbole going on there, but that he did try to see and help others see through medieval eyes. Uh, the most direct time that he did that was in his book, The Discarded Image, which is the summary of uh, many years of his Cambridge lectures. Uh, as a sort of backdrop to medieval poetry. Uh, He tried as a philosopher first. I believe he was always a philosopher first, even as a a, um, professor of literature, then as a professor of literature, and then in a sense as a kind of amateur historian. He tried to help people see other ages kind of through their eyes. And that's what I would like to be able to do and hope that I've done a little bit in this uh, in this book. Um, he uses that image of the sunbeam. He wants to see along the sunbeam and not look at the dust motes floating in it. He uses the medieval as a way of seeing this world. And I think fundamentally that's the vocation of a historian. We are to, if we are not to help others learn to live better in this world, it is a moral discipline then we're just antiquarians collecting butterflies. Mm-hmm. And to help listeners unpack this a little bit further, and because we have you right now, this could be a great time to do this. We've gone through a few of his books. We've gone through Mere Christianity, Screw Tape Letters, Great Divorce, Until We Have Faces. Can you help us understand a little bit how the, his, the medieval church or this framework yeah. that he has adopted or been influenced by comes into these works? Like, How do we see this coming yeah. through these works? If I were to list the works where it most comes in, they're not on your list yet. And <laughs> one of those I've already mentioned, which is a discarded image. Another, in terms of his fictional work, is the Ransom Trilogy, mm. which is deeply influenced, I believe, by uh, his engagement. The Narnia series as well, as uh, I'm convinced by Michael Ward's argument. I think there is a medieval absorption of the Ptolemaic cosmology in Narnia. Uh, I believe the seven planets, so to speak, because the sun and moon are included as planets, are 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 present there. Uh, the same in the space trilogy. When he has Ransom look out the window of the spaceship and see not the black void of the Newtonian cosmos, but this sort of pulsing, illuminated, living kind of reality, um, he's fighting back against um, scientism, a, 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 an exclusively materialistic way of looking at the world. Um, and he's trying to bring it. It's often, you know, we've often talked about the disenchanted ways that we see the world today. This comes back to your sacramentalist worldview that you you mentioned. Um, so anywhere you see, I think, in his fiction in particular, that sense of um, the presence of the divine, of a kind of enchantment and of the material world as participating in that. 
uh, is that uh, Hans Borsman would call that a participatory ontology, ontology being sort of the, the philosophy or the science of being. What is being? Well, being participates in God. It isn't, it isn't completely separated from God. Today we have science over here separated from religion over there. Uh, so how does this come up in, in some of the books you've mentioned? I think he's never far from it. The screw tape letters most particularly reminds me of the, and I mentioned this in the uh, talk about it in two of the chapters of the book, but there's a chapter on medieval ethics. Medieval ethics, um, the tradition of, let's say, the seven deadly sins, the cardinal virtues, is a very precise uh, body of knowledge, and it is very detailed. If you read Thomas Aquinas on the virtues, on the vices, you get tremendous, almost surgical detail about the human heart. Um, I find that all over the screw tape letters. He is he is surgically and very uncomfortably at times sort of anatomizing the human heart. Um, and so I, I think that's the primary influence on the screw tape letters. Um, also, the reality of not only the reality of sin, but the importance of human choice. Um, Dante's uh, famous trilogy, his, his friend Sayers called the drama of the soul's choice. Screw tape is also the drama of the soul's choice. We are not passive in our relationship with spiritual forces, although they try to make us so. But finally, there is this problematic free will that screw tape keeps complaining about that God has given human <laughs> beings, and we are to exercise that well. And of course, the great divorce is also a reflection on that and owes plenty to Dante. Um, I say in the book, and the, many of you may know if you're Lewis fans, when he first encountered Dante, he found it to be absolutely beautiful. And he said one of the most important poems he'd ever read. And he meant important theologically, philosophically, in terms of how we are to live our lives. Finally, till we have faces, I would say um, there's a wonderful book called, I think it's called C.S. Lewis in the Middle Ages by Robert Benig, if I'm pronouncing him right, B-O-E-N-I-G. It was a, a, an award-winning book. He talks about how Lewis takes materials from the literary tradition before him and reshapes them. All right. So you read that hideous strength, for instance, there's bits in there from the Merlin characteristic of T.H. White's stories. But he he takes that and he turns it a few degrees. Uh, he does that all the time. He does it with Dante. He does it with other authors. That is an extremely medieval thing to do. Medievals loved old books. They wanted to hear the same stories over and over again with slight variations, um, just as, say, Tolkien's Hobbits did. Um, and uh, and. He does that, of course, till we have phases is a is a retelling of a Greek myth of, the, of Cupid and Psyche. And so and, and by the way, that it's a Greek myth is also very medieval because um, medieval Christians had no problem going back into the well of Aristotle and Plato and Cicero. And, uh, you know, Dante has a couple of these pagan authors show up, one in limbo and one, in fact, makes it all the way into into heaven. And um this is a sense that all that is good and true in the world, even before Christ, was known because of the, the mind of God, that he was sharing the logos, the sort of seed, the word of his knowledge with people who may not have known the incarnate Christ, but nonetheless knew truth. And it was appropriate to, Augustine said, uh, plunder the Egyptians, to go back into those traditions, pull out what's good, leave behind what doesn't match up with the scriptural witness. And Lewis, of course, does that so effectively in um, until we have faces. Mm. And I have to say it was from reading your book that I've made the commitment. Uh, my short list is Dante now. When, oh man. The way so you good. talked about it, I was like, all right, yeah. this has to happen now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, the conservative commentator and, and uh, uh, rabble rouser, <laughs> uh, Rod Dreher, uh, author of the Benedict option also wrote a book on how something like how Dante can save your life or something like that. And he really is powerful for a lot of people. Um, the closer you get to middle age, you're not there yet, but the closer you get to middle age, the more when you read those opening lines, midway through my life, I found myself lost in a dark wood off of the path. And when I first read that, I was middle aged and I thought, oh boy, he's got my number. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's a wonderful, glorious book. As Dorothy Sayers says, he, he knows how to tell a ripping yarn. He has a sense of humor, um, all of that. Find the right translation. The Mark Musa, the Penguin edition is great, but use Sayers's notes because Sayers just does a wonderful job in her notes. Okay, that's helpful. her translation hasn't worn as well. Uh, it feels very sort of mid mid twentieth century vernacular British, 
Um, but uh, I think Musa does a better job for us, but her notes are wonderful. All right. And I want to ask, because I was actually just in our online kind of Slack community, uh, a member brought up Athanasius and the impact mm. of him on Lewis. And I was, and this was like two hours ago from when we're recording this. Yeah, and I'm thinking yeah. to myself, huh, I'll ask uh, Dr. Armstrong. So what, what would you say yeah. that on, in, on the incarnation and Athanasius' influence on Lewis's work? Well, uh, for one thing, I have to say this, this feels like scholarly bragging, but I'll say it anyway, because it was such a fun experience. I went to the University of Chapel Hill, um, uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. They have part of, because of our relationship with his, uh, 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 with his now departed um, last secretary, um, they uh, have uh, a part of Lewis's personal collection of books, including his copy of On the Incarnation. So I open it up. It's a little thing. I think he read it. It was not uh, Sister Penelope's translation, which he did the foreword for. Uh, probably he read it or read it again while he was working on the foreword for Sister Penelope's translation because the dates line up. He he always wrote the year where he read a book in the end in the end end papers. So it's really cool. You can tell when he read it. Yeah. Um, which is which is a goldmine for Lewis scholars. <laughs> but on the top of every page of that little and it was in Greek, by the way, and I don't know Greek. But on the top of every page in English, he wrote a single sentence summarizing what that page said, the entire book. I thought that was impressive until I found also in the same library his copy of Spencer's Fairy Queen, which is over 600 pages in two volumes. On the top of every page of that, he summarized what was going on on that page. Oh, my goodness. Anyway, so so um, so, yes, he obviously absorbed on the incarnation deeply. Um, He had a lot of metaphors and ways of understanding the incarnation. There's a wonderful uh, a chapter by Paul Fides from Oxford in, I think, the, the Cambridge Companion to C.S. Lewis, where he talks about all of the different images. That image of the statues coming to life is one of those images uh, of kind of what the incarnation does for us. But a deep sea diver who goes down, down, down deep into the water and then brings back up what is precious, brings us back up. Uh, he goes down into the sort of fallen world and he brings us back up. I mean, he... He um, he's clearly orthodox in his Christology, and he's also creative as a as a literary artist and try to trying to explain that. And um, I think so was Athanasius. Increasingly, as his life went on, sacramental way of understanding the world, I think, owes something to both a generalized his knowledge of the medieval tradition on the incarnation, but also his knowledge of, of Athanasius. Um, and uh, it's a wonderful little book and well worth reading. Um, if you can get an English edition and not the Greek like Lewis said. But <laughs> hey, maybe you read Greek. More power to you if you do. <laughs> I wish. Yeah, yeah. So would you say, I'm curious, would you say, because people are very drawn to Lewis and it's amazing. And we've talked about, I mean, so many different denominations are drawn to Lewis. And even today in a world where things have evolved with Christianity and t- tradition sometimes in orthodoxy has has gotten a little bit diluted and there's a fear to it. Um, what do you th- do? You think it's his connection to the medieval church and people's desire to have some of that and uh, some of the beauty from that that draws people to Lewis, or, or what do you think ultimately does, or is that related to this topic? It is related to this topic. I would say I would not put it exclusively in terms of his connection to the medieval church, and I'm glad you brought up Athanasius. I think um, people who've never read in the tradition, so they haven't read the the early fathers either, and they haven't certainly read usually any of the medieval authors, um, encounter in Lewis a kind of clarity and power of expression of the Christian message, which they assume comes from Lewis. Um, The expression comes from Lewis, but the clarity and power, much of it comes from his deep knowledge of both the church fathers and the medieval tradition. Um, He knew Boethius well. He knew Athanasius well. He read Irenaeus. He read um, and then he read all of these, uh, Teresa of Avila and uh, um, Julian of Norwich. And when he wrote letters of spiritual counsel to people who constantly wrote to him asking for spiritual counsel, he would often say, well, you ought to read Julian of Norwich or you ought to read. And I just wonder what these ordinary British people are thinking when they're receiving these letters. Like, Where am I even going to find that? Uh, <laughs> although now there are wonderful English penguin editions with, you know, millions of copies sold of, of all of these authors. So it's much easier to follow Lewis in that today. But I would say Lewis's power, and I say this in the second chapter of the book, is at least partly, uh, maybe largely, in the fact that he's a conduit of a larger tradition. 
And since we don't read that tradition directly, again, talking about uh, Athanasius is on the incarnation, his his forward to that, of course, is titled uh, or has now been titled on reading old books. He would say <laughs> you should read two old books for every new book you read. Well, of course, he practiced that. He probably read 20 old books for every new book he read. Um, famously, when he was writing uh, his book on 16th century English literature, he read every book in English in the 16th century, like every one that, that was available to him. Wow. If you go to the Duke Humphrey Library at, at, uh, at the Bodleian Library at, at Oxford, uh, it's, you know, it's a Harry Potter library. It's just absolutely gorgeous. It's got all of these like 15th, 16th century books chained to shelves and little alcoves. And somebody showed me one of these alcoves and said, yeah, it was probably in a space like this that, that Lewis read all of these books for his 16th century literature. So he's a conduit and he's an articulator. He's a public intellectual who knows how to speak in language that people understand, but who has a deep understanding of what he speaks, a technical understanding. One of my regrets was when I had my year at Oxford and I was able to go to that library and a few of the other ones, I was at that point more or less close to an atheist. And that was actually when I yeah. first got introduced to Lewis and mere Christianity. And it was the beauty of the, the book itself that drew me back, or at least on the journey back. And I just wish I would have understood what I knew now because I really didn't get to take advantage of just the richness of the the environment from an academic perspective, Tolkien, yeah. Lewis, all these authors. I had no appreciation for any of that while I was there. I just enjoyed the gardens because they were beautiful. And there was some Harry <laughs> there was you, some Harry Potter stuff here and it was great. Did you go up the tower of St. Mary the Virgin and look around at all the dreaming spires? No. Nope. Yeah. Well, there's still time. You're young. You can go back. So. <laughs> I was supposed to be there uh, in August, but obviously see COVID hit. And so all my travel plans yeah. got canceled. So I will try to do it yeah. in the next couple of years. Yeah. I'd love to go back. I've been twice. So, yeah, sure. Well, you talked a little bit about in mentions, um, tradition and it's yeah. it's in your book and it comes through and depending on different denominations and we have a very wide listener base tradition could sometimes carry a negative connotation. There could be a yeah, fear there. Um, can you talk about, uh, why, I mean, to some degree, why we shouldn't be afraid of tradition and, and how we can pull it into our, our mm -hmm. faith and how it's not necessarily like contradictory to scripture or things of that nature. Yeah. Well, I think Protestants and especially perhaps evangelical Protestants tend to read uh, any conversation of tradition through the Reformation and specifically through, through Martin Luther. Luther wrote an important tract called The Babylonian Captivity of the Church. His essential point was that he felt that there had been um, elements of, of church tradition uh, by the time he came along in the early um, to mid 16th century that were actively in contradiction to um, sort of the, the, the plain meaning of, of Scripture. Initially, by the way, he thought that the meaning of Scripture really was plain and that it ought to be translated into German for the people and just give it to them and they'll figure it out. <laughs> um, the older he got, the more he realized that that maybe was a mistake because it wasn't quite as obvious and clear to people as he thought it was <laughs> and required some people like his friend Melanchthon to do some actual systematic theology. But any, anyhow, setting that aside. Um, so there is there is a sense in Luther and in the Reformation critique that there is potentially something of a contradictory or uh, controverted relationship between uh, tradition and um, scripture. This is completely not true of the early church and actually not true for most of the uh, uh, of the Middle Ages. Um, what I mean by that is that Christians at that time would not have understood what you meant by making that contradiction. They would have seen um, the liturgy of the church, the, um, the, the doctrine, the theological understandings of the church, uh, certainly the councils and the kind of doctrinal understandings they came uh, through with, which, by the way, are still shared by uh, at least the first seven councils. Uh, the results of those are still shared by all three major confessions, Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox. Um, they wouldn't have known what you meant by setting tradition and scripture at odds with each other, because tradition was the outworking and understanding and interpretation and, and clarification of what is given in scripture. Um, scripture itself can be, can be difficult. You know, we can read through it and um, you know, we were talking about the Trinity. Um, again, there are these sort of contradictory portraits of Jesus. Sometimes he's, he's, you know, in the beginning was the word and the word was God, but sometimes there's this, um, I'm, I'm just a man, I'm just doing what my father tells me to do sort of stuff. And so um, why go back to tradition? Because tradition still 
serves for us the function that it has always served. Um, for one thing, if you believe in the Trinity, you're already involved in tradition. So if you if you want to get rid of that belief, I suppose you could be. And there are those. Um, there's a large still group of Pentecostals who are um, not Trinitarian because they believe that the plain meaning of Scripture, which told us to just baptize in the name of Christ, is that Christ is God. And the other two are kind of modes. When we talk about the Father or the Holy Spirit, those are modes. It's modalism. And um, uh, but I think if you if you believe in the two natures of Christ, that he was both divine and human, if you believe in the Trinity and many other things, you are already thinking on the basis of tradition. And so it's a little bit, um, I won't say hypocritical, but inconsistent um, to to say, well, I don't believe in tradition. I think tradition is a bad thing. Um, More than that, uh, again, coming back to the mediated nature of our faith, we are always encountering God and encountering um, scripture in a context, in a cultural context. And it has always been both appropriate and necessary for thoughtful Christians to engage in theological work in that context. Um, it doesn't mean that the, es- the essence of the, the message of Scripture changes, but it does mean that we have different questions as we address those. Today we have, for example, renewed questions about something called Christian nationalism. Are, can we go straight to Scripture and get all the answers we need on that? No, we have to have we have to think back through, um, you know, leaders and thinkers from before who the church has recognized as being, if not absolutely authoritative, certainly not in the sense of Scripture, at least in tremendously helpful in thinking about things like that. Um, the Protestant Church is at a bit of a disadvantage here, as we do not have the tradition of a magisterium and of uh, encyclicals and that kind of that kind of document where those kinds of things are thought out very carefully, um, not only by the Pope himself, but by larger, larger groups of theologians and, and leaders. Um, I'm not suggesting that Protestants need to have that, but we at least need to take tradition seriously as something of tremendous importance to the church. I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot, so we'll see if you can't answer that's okay. Um, this was something I, as I was rereading through some of my quotes yesterday, to make the notes, but this quote just jumped out to me as beautiful and something that I've always believed. And I want to get your thoughts. Sure. You said in your book, what curious fate has befallen the classical tradition of pastor care in the last five decades? It has been steadily accommodate to a series of psychotherapies. This is not mm. to denigrate modern psychology approaches to the soul care, yet much of the wisdom of those techniques, and there is wisdom in them, was anticipated by more than 1,000 years and better grounded in a Christian framework and people mm. like Gregory the Great. And I've always thought to myself, the reason this jumped out to me, and I, I just loved how you put that in the book, was I've always found so many answers in Christianity. And, mm-hmm. and, I, and I now mm-hmm. see a lot of modern practices taking things that Christianity has essentially had for, <laughs> it seems like, a thousand, two thousand years. And I'm just curious um, if you can unpack that a little bit. Yeah, that insight um, came to me first through a book by Tom Oden uh, called Care of Souls in the Classic Tradition in a theology and pastoral care series edited by Don Browning, I believe, of the University of Chicago. Um, Odin had been a liberal theologian at Drew, uh, uh, a modernist theologian at Drew um, University for many years. He's now passed away fairly recently, um, who was challenged by actually a secular Jewish colleague to go back and look at the church fathers as being something really important to do if you're going to call yourself a Christian. Tom (laughs) did that, and it really took him into small orthodox faith and ultimately really into evangelical circles as wanting to defend a more robust, more traditionally grounded, ironically, but also scripturally grounded um, (laughs) understanding of the faith. And so what is care of souls in the classic tradition? It's sort of an extended exegesis on um, some works of Gregory the Great from the sixth century, especially his book, uh, sometimes translated as the rule of pastoral care or the pastoral rule. What uh, Gregory does in that book is to talk about the, he, he lays out some 32 or 36 sort of polar pairs, types of people who you're going to have in your, as a priest in your congregation. Um, you know, the married and the unmarried, the male and the female, but also more complicated, you know, um, those who uh, sin boldly, uh, but don't let their good works be seen, and those who let their good works be seen, but are sinning on the on the sly. I mean, these really complicated, interesting kinds of profiles. Again, you know, see earlier comments about the 
precision of the moral tradition in in the in the medieval period. Um, and one of the things Odin says, Odin had gotten involved in all of these sort of 60s and 70s um, sort of trendy psychotherapeutic things, encounter groups and meditation and all of this stuff. And um, and he said, you know, there was some good in that. But what I found in Gregory the Great was that he anticipated any of the wisdom in these modern therapies and understandings by, uh, you know, 1500 years and in some cases did it better. So he found that kind of tremendous power of a a careful, um, well thought out, systematic and faithful approach to pastoral care um, that he felt was lost to us largely, especially in evangelical, again, anti-traditional circles, and had been replaced by, you know, somewhat helpful, but not complete um, uh, social scientific approaches. Mm -hmm. I like that. And before asking the final question, I wanted to just read one other quote from your book and for listeners, honestly, to tease them to get excited about it, because I just thought this was such a beautiful sentence you put. We do not want merely to see beauty. We want to be united with the beauty we see, to pass into it, to receive it into ourselves, to bathe in it, to become part of it. I think that was on your chapter and you're talking a little bit about the sacramental worldview. And I was just like, whoa. We, it's so true. We don't want to just, we, we want to be united with it. That phrase right there, I was like, yeah. whoa. That's very Lewisian. It's probably a, almost a direct, it's a paraphrase at least of something that he said. Um, I have to chase that down in the footnotes. But yeah, I, I, I have a talk that I've given that will eventually end up in another book on Lewis and human flourishing, especially how our material and social dimensions of the ways we flourish relates to our ultimate sort of spiritual uh, flourishing in God in in the new creation, and at, the older he got, the closer he got to the end of his life, the more he was willing and able to see experiences of beauty and pleasure uh, on earth as not uh, primarily distractions from the divine, although they could be, but as um, shafts of the glory. He says, as as conduits of um, of God's uh, presence and grace to us. And so I think, you know, this is consistent with that. He would say everything, everything in this world when treated sort of ordinately and carefully can be that kind of a, 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 a portal or a, a conduit for us into, um, into God. Uh, this is not at all pantheism. If you know Lewis at all, you know that that's not the case, but um, yeah, he, he said famously, um, the imagination is the proper organ of uh, meaning. Reason is the organ of truth, but the imagination is the organ of, of meaning. In other words, you can know a lot of stuff with your head, but if you want it to get down in your heart and into the way you live your daily life, it has to be mediated to you through something in your imagination. And of course, the imagination is deeply impacted by beauty. The beginning of the abolition of man, he says, um, you know, there's a textbook of his day that describes uh, someone seeing a waterfall and they say that waterfall is sublime. And then a friend of theirs says, ah, there's no sublimity there. That's all in your imagination. It's all subjective. There's nothing really in that waterfall that's sublime. And uh, Lewis said, you see, that's the problem with Western civilization. <laughs> that's a problem with modernity right there. Yes, there is something in that waterfall. God put it there. So I've never heard that before. I love that. Yeah, yeah. So and, thanks for bringing that, that quote out. Yeah, I mean, that really impacted me, actually. I wrote it down outside in my journal. And then, so final question, we'll have it a Lewis one. It's actually similar to what I asked you earlier about your own sure. life, but what practices, teachings in his own spiritual life to help him grow closer to God did Lewis adopt from the medieval church that you think? Yeah, yeah. I talk in, I talk in the um, book about his devotional mental medievalism, not just intellectual medievalism. Well, starting in 1940, he confessed his sins every Friday to a spiritual director who was a high church Anglican priest named Father Walter Adams. And after his first confession, he said, quote, the experience is like a tonic to my soul. Adams, this this high Anglican priest, also taught him to love the liturgy, the 1662 prayer book, not quite medieval, but still bearing a lot of those marks, the daily office, praying through the Psalter each month helped him to learn that the Eucharist is more than a memorial and a symbol in some of the ways that I described earlier, found himself able to experience the real real presence in, in the Blessed Sacrament. And later in his years, he also used the church calendar to identify with Christ and embrace the sacramental view of marriage. 
and the veneration of the cross in Good Friday services even. And he wouldn't go all the way. He had a belief in purgatory, in fact, but it was uh, a reinterpreted belief. He didn't, I, I think it wouldn't be recognized as a Roman Catholic belief. Uh, some of that comes from his um, strong affinity from Dante. We see some of that worked out in The Great Divorce, this sort of place of, uh, of um, where time is still a reality. Time doesn't happen in hell or heaven. Those are both eternal. But in purgatory, you're still progressing morally and uh, spiritually, and you can make choices that can either help or hinder that progression. Um, and again, he mentioned or uh, recommended in so many of his letters um, books like Walter Hilton's Scale of Perfection, The Theologia Germanica, Lady Julian's Revelations of Divine Love, uh, The Imitation of Christ, um, all of which were uh, medieval uh, devotional books or books of theology. So, apologize because this means I lied about that being my last question, but this made me think of one other thing. <laughs> Go for it. Go for uh, it. Because you just know so much about this and Lewis and his life. What do you think? We've asked this before to listeners, and and we've got different answers from Catholics and Protestants, and just love your full honesty. What do you think it was for him that he got? More like the high Anglican, a lot of these traditions, but yep. couldn't get over either to an Orthodox, like oh, big O Orthodox, or Catholicism right. itself, like the holdups. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, some of this is explained by the fact that he'd simply grown up in the Anglican Church. It was his spiritual home. Um, I recognize that there are theories out there about his his Irish background, Irish Protestant background, and how there was a kind of a prejudice there that would have would have. Uh, I know Joseph Pierce argues that he should he should have become a Catholic, but didn't. <laughs> we did um, have him on. <laughs> the problem I have with Joe's argument, love you, brother, if you're out there listening. But the problem <laughs> I have with your argument is that um, Lewis was is the most consistent person I know in terms of following his his own lead intellectually, following the evidence where it led him. Um, he is there's a there's a wonderful book by my friend Adam Barkman called C.S. Lewis and Philosophy as a Way of Life. Uh, riffing on a phrase of a, of a French scholar named uh, Pierre Hadot, philosophy is a, f- a way of life, is a way for us as moderns to correct what philosophy meant to the ancients and indeed the medievals. Uh, nobody studied philosophy because they wanted to, uh, you know, contrary to the stereotype of medieval philosophy, they were not all that interested in how many angels would dance on the head of, head of a pen, but they did certainly want to know how to live their earthly temporal life in such a way as best to prepare them for their eternal life. And uh, that really goes back to Plato and Aristotle, who had frameworks that were at least quasi-theistic, I think maybe in Plato's uh, case, maybe fully theistic. And so Lewis read what he read and wrote what he wrote fundamentally out of a desire to know how to live and to help others to know how to live. Had he become convinced, as, as Joe thinks that he perhaps did, that, uh, that the, best, um, the best, most helpful, uh, most true way of living was within the Roman Catholic confession, he would have gone there. That's, that's finally my sense of, of him and, and why he didn't make that move. And in, in, don't tell our listeners this. I think I'm in your camp a little bit more there. I don't get the sense yeah. that uh, he, he just seemed like he's someone who lived out his convictions more than anyone I know. And We're both going to get letters from our friend Joe. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> David's going to be like, Matt, you can't say that. No. <laughs> this was absolutely fantastic. So listeners, I can, Thanks, I man. know we'll be hearing this and being like, whoa, I want to hear more of you, read more of you, and, and consume more of you in your content. And so where can people yeah. find out more about you, uh, your works, your books? Where are some good places for all that? So far, I've got two books. I got a bunch of other chapters and stuff. A lot of it's fairly academic, the chapters anyway, and essays and talks. Um, if you ever come to the to the um, uh, the Institute for Medieval Studies at um, each year at Kalamazoo, Michigan, you can probably meet me there because I've given papers there and enjoyed that over the years. In terms of finding my books, I have an Amazon author page. My first book is called Patron Saints for Postmoderns. Second one is called, as you said, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Christians. The subtitle is extremely long, but it's relevant. Uh, finding authentic faith uh, in a forgotten age with C.S. Lewis. They finally let me put Lewis on the cover <laughs> uh, because he's in every chapter and he's deeply interwoven into the argument. Um, I blog at a blog site called gratefultothedead.com. Uh, if you ever want to email me, that's my email address, gratefultothedead at gmail.com. Um, people wander onto my blog site looking for stuff about Jerry Garcia and then are confused. But, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, 
I hope you understand what it means to be grateful to the dead. <laughs> Since we've been talking about tradition and medieval stuff all, all, all episode. And then finally, I am working on another book. It may be years down the road, but I'm really interested in the medieval history of the origins of the university, the hospital, the um, uh, um, the arts as we know them, science as we know it. Um, in some cases, uh, in, in most cases, there's a gathering together of many influences. There's Muslim influence. There's scholars from other parts of the world. But it is very much a Christian story. Um, in particular, not just to say Christians got there first, have no real interest in that. That's an apologetic thing. But more to say, what were the theological commitments that these people had who were engaged in the university, healthcare, all of these important sectors, where today we don't have any of that. We've, we're the other side of a secularizing move in all of these institutions. Not to bring those institutions back. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon, although God can do the impossible. But to equip us who are working in these sectors as Christians to really bring our faith to the table when we uh, and 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 to our to our own um, work in these in these fields. So. I mean, that'll take a few years. My first book took five years to write. Medieval Wisdom took six years. That's headed in the wrong direction. So hopefully I'll shorten that up. I love it. And we want to say, as always, guys, thanks to our top tier supporters, Jeff, Chris, John, Kate, Rowdy, you guys, and all of our Patreon supporters make this possible. Uh, as a reminder, if you guys have enjoyed these interviews and our episodes, it's really helpful for the reviews on iTunes. We read every single one of them. Um, check out our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. And uh, we want to thank... Chris for being on here. It was absolutely incredible, Chris. I, I genuinely mean that I was, this is just fantastic. You're very clear and clear with your answers and, and so engaging. I was just very impressed. So thank you so much. Thank you, Matt. Thanks. I appreciate it. It was a pleasure to come. Excellent. And so listeners, join us next time when we'll be going further up and further in. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>